It's how to create a sustainable competitive advantage by using artificial intelligence technology and big data. I would like to introduce briefly, I have long uh, bios, but briefly, briefly, I would like to introduce our panelists for today. Associate Professor in Computer Electrical and Mathematical Sciences and Engineering Division and the Field Leader at the Visual Computing Center at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. Most welcome, Dr. Yeah. Bernard Hanen. He is the Deputy GM of Benitech, leading the incubation entrepreneurship business development arm. He is behind the Agri-Food Innovation Hub, Agri-Tech program, focused on sustainable future using tech and innovation. Ambassador of the Global Compact Network Lebanon, focusing on the SDG 9. Most welcome on stage, Rami Mujaudi. He is currently a Director of Engineering at Karim, looking after data science and data platforms. His role is to transform the region by bringing artificial intelligence at the core of Karim products. Most welcome, Osama Berti. His career has been focused on delivering solutions to clients and internal partners alike. He is 14 years, his 14 years of experience and test to his native technology and software leadership skills. He is a co-founder and chief executive officer of Idea to Life. I would like to welcome on stage Ali Sen. <laughs> he is an enterprise architect at Darren Handessa with more than 20 years of experience in the information technology sector. He leads yes. research and development efforts in the IT department focused around digital transformation. Most welcome, Haysam Hassani. Our panelists will be hosted by the moderator of the panel. He is a professor at St. Joseph University. His teaching covers applied mathematics, artificial intelligence, data mining, big data courses, and various program-related courses. He, his research interests include high-performance computing, artificial intelligence, and data analytics. The stage is for the director of the National Institute for Telecommunication and Information Technology in, at St. Joseph University of Beirut, Dr. Danny Nisk. Good morning, everyone. We have uh, such a... Our plan will be creating a sustainable competitive advantage by using AI and technology and big data. So I would like to start with Professor Bernard uh, Hanen. What is AI? How does it relate to big data? And what are the pros and cons? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so thanks for the question. Um, so we hear all, all of these buzzwords around AI, machine learning, deep learning. And a lot of people nowadays, unfortunately, they kind of use them interchangeably. And everybody now is an AI expert, everybody's a scientist, everybody's a machine learning expert also. So let me just put it into context. Uh, AI is a program that can sense what's around it, reason about it, act upon it, and adapt. So it's a big circle. Machine learning, within that circle, is a type of AI system subfield of AI, that makes use of data-driven approaches. They use data. Within that, is what they call deep learning, which is just a technique of doing machine learning, but now it's gotten a lot of you know, attention because it's actually working better than what it was uh, or what other machine learning methods were doing before. Okay, so those are the three kind of uh, levels. So AI is an old field. Um, it's actually decades old. Right? Um, one of the big pro that we see here with AI or machine learning or whatever you want to call it is the fact that it's automating things and tasks that were manually done by humans. Okay, which is a good thing because we spend a lot of our time doing manual tedious labor that could have been done at, at, or time that's wasted that could have been used for more creative things, which is what humans are really good at. All right? Um, that's the major pro of, of AI. So, for example, you see a growth in um, products that use AI. So, if you open up your smartphone, everybody here probably has a smartphone. Anything from your search to your voice recognition 
to your Siri or Iris or whatever version of uh, assistant that you use makes use of data-driven approaches, AI, deep learning, all these other methods. Uh, companies are heading towards, they're already making use of uh, these techniques. They're building up research labs all over the place. Uh, they're spending and getting a lot of money in terms of revenue because of services they can provide based on these AI methods. Now, I want to focus a little bit on the cons more because, uh, and let's put, nip it in the bud. If somebody were to hear what was said before, Unfortunately, it's like such a bleak future that we live in, right? Everything is going to get replaced and people are not going to have jobs and... Okay, let me tell you what the real history of AI was. AI has been around for decades, okay? It's not a new term. Decades. And the biggest con that I see is that the, the, the perception of what this thing actually means. And this... So, at the beginning in the early 90s, there was an idea of trying to replicate the neuron, right? The little thing in our brains, the, the, the core of what our uh, brains are, are made of. And people were so hyped up about, oh, this is going to be the future, and so much funding was available for, uh, at that time. We weren't able to uh, replicate it even close enough. And the expectation was to build an artificial brain by 1995 or something. That did not happen. It didn't even come close to that. It's not, we're still not even close to right now. So this perception of what AI is and what's going to be, what it's going to become is dangerous. Dangerous, really. So with all respect to the MP and what he said about consciousness and whatnot, that's not happening right now, for sure. And it's going to take a long, long time for that maybe to ever happen. This whole idea of Terminator coming to take our jobs and our lives and whatnot, it's not going to happen. Yes, there are AI agents out there that have been trained on particular tasks, let's say the Go game, uh, chess, uh, these gains here and there, search and so forth, but these are specific tasks. The major hurdle in AI really is to be able to, for this AI algorithm, machine learning algorithm, to be able to be creative, innovative. So can it take a task that we trained it on, take that skill, and transfer it over to another task that we never trained it on? If they ever reach, these algorithms ever reach a point where they can do that, then, you know, we might want to be a little bit concerned. But regardless, we're not even there yet. So this whole idea of making uh, use of AI and being scared of it, don't be scared of it. It's a tool. It's very useful. It automates things that are tedious, but it's not going to replace that many jobs so soon. So for even for self-driving cars, even if you talk to the heads of R&D labs of like Uber and Google and so forth, there's a reason why we don't see autonomous drive, uh, uh, driving cars uh, on U.S. streets, even though, or on some U.S. streets. The reason why it's a very hard problem, right? And there's going to be a lot of time needed for us to develop that uh, and to reach that point. And this is just for driving. Imagine things that are more complicated. So rest assured, there's no Terminator, there's no singularity anytime uh, near. Uh, the worst that we can do is to have this negative perception and think that AI is going to take over in I don't know how many years. This is what killed AI after the time when they thought they were going to build a neuron or an artificial brain, that killed it. There was an AI winter, you know, winter is coming. There's an AI winter that it went through. It was because of this perception. They thought, oh, AI is going to take over. It happened before. Let's not make it happen again. Okay, thank you. Well, one thing that I was happy, I was happy with the presentation of Dr. Hajj, but the number four that he mentioned about was, was quite, quite an interesting number. So, one thing that we're proud of in Lebanon is that the, the early stage ecosystem for entrepreneurship is, is growing, there's potential, and we've seen a lot of uh, our startups that we're working with is working on AI as solutions. So, we have some of them working on, on chatbots that are going to work on retail solutions, uh, trying to help you know, uh, in sales, in, in bringing more data and information for, for the, the, the big groups, FMCGs, the retailers, and so on. We have people working on trading platforms, using AI and, and, and analyzing trends and so on. We have people working on, on AI for facial recognition, security, uh, you name it. So, so we are not far from, from that, so we do have a lot of individual 
uh, initiatives, individual startups, programs that are really uh, going through that wave of change, going through those uh, changes. Uh, Ali is one of them, he's part of, of our community at Baytech, and there are others within the community. Um, for example, one of the startups that, that, that is doing great now is working uh, called NAR, is working on uh, AI recognitions of, of pipelines and oil and gas. They've implemented their first projects in Canada, moving into the US, moving into the, 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 the pipeline industry across the globe, reducing all the risk of humans uh, in terms of uh, uh, visual, visual inspections of pipeline, which is a major health and safety requirement for all the big, big uh, oil companies. Uh, so there are big problems uh, that Lebanese startups are working on. Uh, AI is, as Bernard said, is not a big beast. It's definitely a tool. A tool that if we master well, if we know how to, how to, to work with, we can uh, ride on that wave of change, like ride on the new economy, the industry 4.0. Uh, AI is highly used in IoT as well, in terms of decision making, in terms of change, in terms of processes, and it's used also in agriculture and many other parts of the world. Now we come to Thank you. First, uh, thank you for the invitation. I also want to thank the organizers and especially Ms. Reen for having me today. Uh, it's such a, such a lovely group. Uh, it's uh, amazing to be here. Thank you. Uh, so, to answer your question of how does Kareem leverage AI, uh, I want to start by uh, sharing our mission. Kareem's mission is what makes every Kareem wake up in the morning. Uh, and what makes us all motivated. Uh, our mission is to improve and simplify the lives of people and to build an awesome organization that inspires. It inspires through its leaders, its people, it inspires through its impact, and it inspires through its technology. And it becomes a no-brainer that in order to fulfill our mission, we need to leverage the power of the newest and most powerful technologies, and AI is one of them. Now, to bring together the two parts of the mission, improve and simplify the lives of people, plus AI, we, I like to call it purposeful AI. It means that everything that we do, every piece of code, every algorithm that we write, its goal is to actually improve and simplify the lives of people out there. Yeah. So, how does it work in practice, right? So, I just want to bring the distinction between two mindsets around AI, right? So, there is the AI that everyone talks about on the news, right? Uh, Self-driving cars and uh, uh, personal assistants and uh, 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 like the thing that we are my is hairy and we, we like to talk about. But the biggest sweat of AI in the, in the company level, in organization level, is actually all the small improvements that can happen in your system that are actually really hidden and bring tremendous value. I'm going to give you a very simple example of how we actually leverage machine learning, which is a part of AI, in improving the lives of people. So if you open your app right now, we're going to give you what we call an ETA, which is an expected time of arrival. So we're going to tell you, hey, your car is going to arrive in five minutes. So these five minutes has so many uncertainties in the way it's calculated. It's very difficult to get it right. For first, there is the fact that there is a road network. Right? There is the fact that there is traffic or there is no traffic. There is the fact that the captain might take one road or the other. There is the fact that the captain might drive fast or drive slower. So there is a whole bunch of uncertainties around this problem. Now, we can solve this problem using the classical methodologies, which is coming up with a million if-else statements that say, hey, if it's in this hour of day, if it's in this day of week, if it's in this road, if the captain belongs in the group of the captain who drives fast in the morning because they're hungry, uh, like a million of if-else statements, then show five minutes, otherwise show six minutes, right? 
And in order to solve the single problem, we would need 100 engineers. Now, that's where actually AI becomes very, very, very useful and powerful, is that through historical data and through just like understanding how things have been happening in the past, we can actually predict in a, quite an accurate way what is actually the, actual, the exact actual time of arrival, and we replace all of these rules in, in the, that I have been describing. And for that, we only need one data scientist. Right? So, to answer, to summarize the answer to the question, how does Kareem leverage AI? It does leverage it to improve and simplify the lives of people. Right? It does leverage it in every single decision that is made in the app. Every single thing when it comes to matching, when it comes to demand and supply forecasting, when it comes to our operations, when it comes to like price estimations, ETAs. So everything related to the experience, everything related to the systems, and everything related to the people is actually improved through the power of AI. Thank you. So. I would like to, uh, to move now to Engineer Alizay from Idea to Life. So, how is AI changing our and work environment and we will look at the scientific is it scaling us or increasing us? Thank you. So, uh, to start when my colleagues concluded, uh, technology is a tool, it's for us to decide what to do with it. At Kareem, they're definitely using the power of AI to make our experience better. For us, and at Idea to Life, our philosophy, the question is, is it artificial intelligence, AI, or is it IA, intelligence augmented? We're trying to focus more on that, augmenting people using technology and stay positive and implement that, not just by creating a philosophy about augmenting people or making people's life or people's experience easier by implementing it. Same way as Kareem is implementing it, we had a chance, and then try to be precise and try to be narrow here and quick. We had a chance to work with the Ministry of AI in Dubai. They came to us with this challenge. Technology is replacing the human. Our people are worried about that. How can we change this perception? So our design thinking team with Rudna and my, my other colleagues, we went back to our philosophy, to our mission and processes. We interviewed a lot of resources, a lot of employees. We've watched them around their work. And we managed to define happiness at work. Happiness was the key start of augmenting and upskilling or changing the culture at work using artificial intelligence. How's that? We're going to make it very simple. If I'm focused on a task, if I'm in the zone, I wouldn't like to be interrupted. That's very simple. I would like to be more interrupted when I'm not in the zone, when I'm not feeling well, when I'm tired, when I'm showing fatigue signs. So a simple chatbot can help my colleagues interrupt me at the right time, ask me the right question at the right time, and delay it when I'm not ready to answer. That would increase empathy, would enhance my my experience and my time at the office, and it will also increase efficiency. That's a very simple example. We can go to a very complicated example, which is, should I have a four working day week this week and be more productive instead of going for five days? If I'm showing signs of whatever fatigue signs are, I could take a day off because the engine is asking me to take a day off and still work four days instead of five, but still be more productive. This is like at the extreme end of the spectrum. So yes, artificial intelligence, technology, can make our experience better, can change the work environment, and we can go more and more into details there. Thank you. I would like to, to ask uh, Mr. Hassan Hasbani, uh, architecture and AI, this is a little bit strange, so if you can tell us how to use AI in, in the Okay. Uh, 
in the domain of architecture, engineering, and construction industry, it's uh, actually similar to in many other industries in the market in the way the AI algorithms are being uh, deployed. I mean, we can mainly classify them into three categories. The AI is used uh, in uh, diagnostic analytics, so it's helping us uh, determine why events are happening and the root cause for this, using uh, hidden patterns in the data. The second level is uh, using uh, pre predictive analytics, and that's looking at past data in order to recommend what are the most likely things to happen. And the third, and that's one of the most advanced level, is in the domain of prescriptive analytics. That's actually recommending actions and even taking actions based on the predictions that have been uh, performed in the, in the previous stages. So, uh, in, the, in the AEC industry, it's actually catching up with the front runners currently that we know about, which are the high techs, the fintechs, and the telcos. And the idea centers around <coughs> the built and the living environment. So, currently, we all aspire to occupy buildings, use facilities, and live in cities that are tagged with this smart or the intelligent tag. And that tag is emanates from the goal of having an environment that's sustainable, livable, and that's optimized and safe costs. And the approach in doing this has been looking at collecting data from the environment internally and externally and putting that data, correlating it in order to take measurable actions to enhance, as I said, the cost, the deliverability, and the optimization of, of these environments. <coughs> and the, the, the proliferation of IoT, big data, and the breaking of silos across uh, different domains has facilitated this revolution, actually. So it hasn't come in a, in a fortnight. So if we want to mention some of the domains, uh, in the facility management, for instance, uh, AI is assisting in, uh, in proactive uh, maintenance. So the, there are algorithms that can predict uh, certain when the, certain equipments can fail, uh, and that will help in reducing downtime and reducing accidents. In the domain of energy consumption, also, it's not being just reactive. It's uh, there are now algorithms that will allow you to predict when the energy demand is going to go up, and for example, preheat the uh, rooms or uh, pre-cool uh, the rooms. In the domain of transportation. Optimizing the, the traffic control, especially with you know, the autonomous cars. The, in the domain of safety, with the with the booming of the and accuracy of the uh, face recognition, this is helping us in, in safety, CCTV, video analytics. So uh, all of these domains are coming slowly, and and they're moving to be transformative and disruptive. Uh, we're also actually holding tomorrow a session. At 2 p.m., we're showing a, a practical example on how we're using AI in site uh, safety and image recognition. If you're willing really to attend, you uh, will be most welcome. Thank you. So, so now we have a more positive view of AI. So, the Terminator uh, hypothesis is ruled out. So, uh, Professor Van, how do you see AI helping local and regional problems? Well, I I thought it was yeah. I thought it was loud enough. Um, so basically, the any traditional company right now, and by traditional I mean uh, the ones that have been going around for a long time. Um, if and I'll keep this short, um, if they don't use uh, data-driven approaches, uh, not to say AI, yeah, machine learning, all these uh, keywords, uh, they should. It, and, and the one, at least the big companies that I've consulted with in the region and, and, and whatnot, uh, they're, uh, they're going as far as building their own institutes within the company to teach their current employees about data science uh, practices. Um, for the uh, startups that are coming up, I would really advise not to get into um, uh, more old problems that are either being solved right now by the big players or already solved. So, uh, face recognition, detection. I think that's a solved problem already, uh, but there are lots of lots of uh, new important problems that need to be solved, and this is what I would advise the startups to work on. 
Um, just lastly, um, I, as, a, as a fact, uh, MIT, uh, universities play a big role in, in because where, where are these companies going to get their uh, work, uh, workforce from? Universities play a big, play a big role. MIT is uh, uh, aware of this, and Berkeley is the same thing. They're, they've uh, put to, uh, at least MIT has announced a $1 billion school of computing that's going to teach every single person on campus, be it engineers, computer scientists, physicists, chemists, English majors. Everybody on campus is going to learn the basics of data science on campus at MIT soon. So the universities have to keep up. Uh, it's a skill like any other that should be acquired by, by almost everybody, and it will benefit the future for, for Lebanon and the region. Thank you. I would advise against that. Okay. Okay, so uh, we move back to, uh, to Rami. Uh, Rami, we are hoping that uh, your project Agri Food will be able to assist the Alive. So, can you give us some more insight on that? Sure. Uh, we started AgriTech, the Agri Food Innovation Hub uh, in Lebanon, to look at problems in the region as a whole. So, Lebanon is one of them, but uh, uh, in the region we have major issues to, to sustain food security and, and food uh, availability for people in the region. And we believe that technology and engineering can solve a lot of those problems if we are able to adapt technologies to the current users uh, in the farming and the agri-food processing uh, sector. Uh, so the Agritech program started two years ago. We've, we've been through two batches of, of, uh, of, uh, of Agritech as an accelerator. And when we look at the sector in agriculture, uh, there is a lot of use of AI in the sector. So whether it's in satellite imagery and analysis, whether it's in drone imagery, whether it's in, in uh, uh, prediction of harvesting and, and volumes, whether it's in detection of diseases. Uh, one of the startups that we have currently uh, in, in the batch uh, called IO3 is working on uh, AI and machine learning to detect the Mediterranean food cloud, which, affecting, which is affecting most of the, the problems with apple export and everything else. One of the major things that we have in Lebanon is that we overspray pesticides on our fruits and vegetables to minimize the impact of insects. So what they're doing is early detection, uh, uh, early detection of uh, pesticides to ensure that spraying is done more on, on a, a cure basis and not as a major prevent preventive. There have been other, other players uh, within the program and beyond working on AI. Labor shortage is a major concern, so when we look at, at California, how they are taking AI um, and technology into replacing the humans because there is not enough humans to pick strawberries or lettuce or any of this manual labor that nobody wants to work in anymore. Uh, when we look at, at uh, you know, all the, the, the indoor farms, the high-tech farms, there's a lot of data points that are collected that are put, and all this data is analyzed and optimized to improve better production. So, when it comes to agriculture and, and AI, uh, the future is still long. The problems, as Bernard said, there's, there are many problems that still need to be solved. So people who are in the field of, of, uh, of uh, data science, people who are in the field of, of technology, need to look at agriculture uh, as a major route. We all need to eat, we all need to, to, uh, to feed our families. Uh, if we don't solve uh, problems in the agriculture sector, sector using technology and innovation, we will have a real major problem, especially in this part of the world, especially with water as well. We haven't mentioned water, but water management for agriculture could be highly used, uh, improved using AI. Thank you. So, so Mr. Burke, what is your vision, vision of the future of the transportation sector? What is a very disruptive uh, Thank you. This is a good question that I was not prepared to. Um, I believe in uh, a world that is uh, highly optimal. Um, I think that the world we live in is very wasteful. Uh, the way we live as human beings is um, can really be improved. Um, I was watching, re-watching The Matrix recently, um, and um, there was this scene where um, uh, uh, Agent Smith uh, was uh, uh, 
uh, interrogating uh, Morpheus and he told him that uh, mammals generally when they live in an ecosystem, they live within the ecosystem. Uh, but us humans are different. Uh, when we live in an ecosystem, we actually eat up all the resources until it's destroyed and then we have to move to a new ecosystem in order to survive. And there is one single entity that actually has this behavior and it's a virus. Uh, so the way we live as human beings is extremely wasteful and uh, I do believe that we can only survive if we improve our way of being and if we integrate more with nature and with the ecosystem. Uh, and transportation is a big part of it. We all need to move around, but we need to move around in an efficient manner. We need to move together more often. We need to find out better routes. We need to use more uh, 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 waste, like uh, energies that are less wasteful for our environment. Uh, so my vision of the future of this form of transportation is a vision that is green, like the color of green. Okay. So, uh, so how can local and regional companies benefit from AI and big data? How they can benefit? First, first of all, they need to, to adopt it. And, and, and there's a difference between enterprises and between uh, entrepreneurs or startups. So on an enterprise level, to benefit and to adopt, first, they should start with the governments. Our most successful AI implementation in supply chain 4.0 transformation was for an oil and gas company because it started with the VP of supply chain but he pitched the vision to the CEO who approved it and they pitched it to the board of directors and the chairman also approved and pushed behind everyone and behind the team. So with the governments, things start to become easy. We have the business case ready, we have the budget ready. Now, step two, business needs to be digital. If they're not digital, if everything, if all the data is on papers, then they can't benefit. So step two is to have it digitized, and step three is to prepare the team for digital transformation. There's definitely a lot of smaller details that happens in between each of those transitions, but for the time constraint, I don't know guys, maybe you were not seeing the guys on top with the two minute time out, time out. But actually you started so, late, so. Yeah, so I, I'm not gonna go into the details. If, if we get asked any question, I'll answer it. And answering it from the startups angle, and I would like to add what, what Rami was sharing and maybe help because we share the same challenges. I think for the startup, the governance and the adoption and the, all of that is there because they're, by nature they are, they are building into that mission and vision. They need more of a support and we had our previ the previous panel and, 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 and our colleagues, I mean, they were discussing about all the challenges and I think there should be some help so we can help back the government and the country evolve. And that help is very simple. We just need that playground to validate all what we're doing. So I'll give an example. If, if, if a startup is working on an AI platform for the educational uh, sector, which is the most affected sector by, by 2035, 85% more profits and revenues are gonna come from that sector in 15 years from now, because of AI, why can't we leverage on the data and the schools we have, and we have plenty in our systems? We don't need money, we just need the playground there. We need to test and validate our findings so we can take that success and go to the world and say that this startup, that this level for the public schools, it's measured, it's tested, and let's sell it and grow it abroad versus then just going abroad, presenting what we can do. Okay, well, if you didn't do it where you're coming from, why would we trust you? I mean, in Dubai, they would always give, because just giving Dubai as the closest to us that's done like a major leap in the last 20 years, they would give a super privilege to their startups. 
Another example in the agriculture. I don't know if there is any collaboration between the Ministry of Agriculture and the startups. And can they give us that playground to support us and to validate all what we're doing? So that's the difference between enterprise and between startups. I'm happy to answer any question later on, but I hope I, I answer. Yes, one, one last and quick uh, intervention from Mr. Uh, Hasbini. So, how strategy, what strategy should organizations follow to remain competitive? As we see uh, from the introductory panels today, uh, it's an industrial revolution, and we have enough from the past history. If uh, organizations do not embrace this change, they're going to lose their competitive advantage and they're going to not be able to compete anymore. It's also, uh, Mr. Muhammad said that there's no magic wand, but there are some very, clear, uh, very clear steps that Ms. Nashar also mentioned in her presentation, that one of the key aspects is to embrace digitization. If the organization is not at that level of maturity, they have to do, transform their business, their processes, their capabilities in order to capitalize on the, on the digital technologies. Um, for example, I can state an example from my domain. Digitization of, for example, the engineering industry is to be able to change the way you design your work, the way you supervise your in the construction uh, field. It also has to use uh, management support, executive support to be able to embrace this change. Otherwise, it cannot, it will stay in a departmental uh, domain for it. There's also the idea of seeking help. It doesn't have to be a do-it-on-your-own initiative. There are a lot of expertise in the market, and we also, in the, in the, in the job market, there's a big shortage in data scientists and skills that can happen in this way. Uh, and even big companies are seeking partnership and acquisitions to boost their capabilities. Uh, and after all, also, there's the, the, are the individuals. Uh, we live in an era where the previous skills we no longer be the same, we have to adapt. It's a continuous and lifetime learning that we have to stress on in order to stay relevant. I also read a, uh, an initiative in Japan, they call it the Society 5.0. So they are at a stage in looking at, if we know 1.0, society was hunting, moved into agriculture, then industry, information, and looking into a super smart society and building the, and that center of it, building the capacity of their people. Thank you very much. So we have time for one question. Okay, uh, thank you so much for this valuable session. I actually have a question for Professor uh, Ghanem. Um, uh, we know that uh, uh, you are coming from Kaos, which is uh, Kikapella University of Science and Technology. Having visited this place and amazed by the development and the innovation in this university in Saudi Arabia, which is breaking all the stereotypes we heard uh, and we know about Saudi Arabia. And now uh, we read that IBM is uh, also signing an MOU to establish a research lab in Kaust, as well as your uh, personal um, uh, research uh, with uh, Boeing. Can you please tell us why Saudi Arabia and how can we probably learn from the Saudi experience in Lebanon? Thank you for the question. I didn't really want to talk about where I'm coming from and, and, and whatnot, but um, KAUST is a very young university, nine years old. It's research uh, uh, based, so there's only master and PhD students there. Uh, it only focuses on science and technology. It's really focused on certain, certain areas. Uh, AI is one of them, for sure. Um, and the evidence of what we've been doing there has, has shown. Uh, we have research labs from the big companies establishing their, uh, their centers there at the house. Um, and to be honest, I mean, why doesn't this happen everywhere else in the, in the region? Uh, Emirates, the UAE has uh, the Ministry of AI, obviously, but they also have this new institute called Institute of Innovation in AI, IIAM. It's just specifically meant for AI, uh, targeting the applications in government and, and, and better AI. Um, there are other places, uh, a, little, uh, a few places, uh, other places in the region, but why not Lebanon? I mean, the, the major, uh, as, as it was mentioned before, 
the workforce in AI, there's a, there's a huge demand for it. I'm going to give an example. Coursera is an online platform for, to teach you classes. There's a nano degree on deep learning there. You should, I recommend everybody to take it. In the US, if you take a Coursera nano degree in deep learning, you're guaranteed by the company to find a job within a year. Otherwise, they pay you back uh, the, the money for the nano degree. That's, that's a lot of confidence. And the reason why is there's a huge demand. So if you don't know AI, I mean, you're, you know, you know if you do know AI, though, you, you have a huge market to target. So human resources, talented, skillful, Work, uh, workforce is the future and Lebanon for sure if it's the only thing that we're proud of is the human uh, resources that we have and so if we evolve that more and keep up to date with that there will be a market there will be demand and uh, nobody's better than anybody else we can compete on that front all right thank you Disrupted Lebanese dream, I would say vision, because dream is something that we cannot reach, but maybe vision is something that can unite us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.